Um, just the when if you're the last person to use the hot plate, make sure you switch it off. You know, yesterday in the afternoon somebody had left it on, but this is okay. What's not okay is um, is this. You know, this is you know this is not what I expect for Chem One B level students. In fact, this, whoever did this shouldn't be handling any chemicals at all. I mean, you don't want to trust them with, uh, with anything. And so this is not acceptable lab technique. But not just, not just one balance, but every single balance. So, you know, maybe one bad. <laughs> Actually, this is the afternoon class. And they didn't even clean it up. Nobody even told me oh, that did. they had a little accident. <laughs> You guys did, and you cleaned it up. That's good lab technique. You know, you clean up after yourself. But this is bad lab technique because uh, it's still sitting there, good one. And so this is not acceptable either. And so I think, you know, there's some people who don't have adequate lab skills for this class, you know, and um, if, if they don't, uh, I mean, look at all the dichromate on there. Oh my God. This, this, not only is this bad, it corrodes the, the metal and, and it causes health, health effects too, so it's bad. This is bad. I mean, they should go back to Chem 4 <laughs> and, uh, and practice some more, you know. The, how to transfer solids without making a mess and contaminating yourself and other people is, is an important skill to have. So... You know, actually, this is the worst. You know, normally, I, d I never, never, you know, yeah, this is actually the worst I've seen, the balances. So I have, I'm going to have to keep a close eye on what's going on and then make, maybe suggest. Alright, so watch out. Lab technique is a very important part of Chem 1B. And, uh, you know, I was thinking we'll avoid overcrowding by working in groups. Normally I do this individual, uh, but I overbooked the class, so I'm doing it. Lately I've been doing it in groups because uh, enrollment's been so impacted, but I don't like to do it in groups. Uh, one lab that we're going to do half group half individual is the next lab. The next lab deals with um, qualitative analysis. A lot of you have done qualitative analysis in Chem 4. You know. And so the first part that's going to work with groups is you're going to go run through the entire experiment with a partner or partners if you want. And then once you're done um, with the entire experiment and you've seen all the reactions and, and you should see all the reactions because you're going to be working with a known that contains all the unknowns. You know. And so you should test positive. Do you guys know what qualitative analysis is? I'm assuming you do. Qualitative analysis is just figuring out, in this case, what ions are in solution by doing some simple chemical reactions, chemical tests to see. But those simple chemical reactions aren't so simple uh, when you put them all together. You know, a lot of thought went into the uh, analysis scheme. But uh, you're going to run through the whole thing in, in a group and then after that then everybody's going to run through their own individual unknown. When you run through the, through the whole reaction as a group, it's open everything. I mean, you can look at your notebook, your lab manual, whatever. But when you actually run through the unknown yourself, everything's going to be closed except your lab notebook. And so you're going to do it based strictly on the procedure that you wrote in your lab notebook and your observations that you took. And then we'll see, you know, are you writing adequate observations and adequate procedures so that you could actually repeat the experiment solely from your notes? You should be able to. Alright, so is that clear? That's going to be taking place over multiple lab periods. Uh -huh. 
you should do the pre-lab, but you don't prep the entire lab. You know, it's a very long experiment. And so you prep what you think you can make through one, one day. Now on Tuesday, I'm going to lecture about it, and then on Thursday, we're actually going to start it. And so you, you just have to have the pre-lab done by Thursday. And so just every day you prep, I think I can make it this far. Yeah, actually, there's a limited number. You only have 10 possible ions. For your known, you're going to have all 10 of them. You know. For your unknown, um, I'm not going to give you the number. You know, it could be anywhere from 1 to, to 10. Uh, any other questions about next week's lab? Can we have the test of Tuesday? Yeah, we have the test on Tuesday, so what I, you know, I was saying we'll finish this next time, but maybe we'll finish this on Thursday. That way we don't have to. You, you can wait any time on Thursday. Like that. And if they just sit there, it should be no problem. The crystals are stable. Yes, uh, did I, I didn't have them posted it yet. Not for 15? No. Okay. I was about to post it, and uh, I had to run out, so I guess I didn't <laughs> finish it. Like, like I said, um, I, uh, I had to uh, do some stuff to get that, and so it took some time. There Sorry. Multiple There's multiple choice on this test. You'll see it. Uh, the, 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 your test will be kind of similar to it in, in terms of format. I look back at it. It's been a while since I looked. It, it's only one page long. And some multiple choice, some calculations. The exam is only one page. Mm -hmm. Any chapter? One page, six point font. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that it's actually it's it's kind of small font. So if you have a hard time reading it, um, no, it's 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 like it's still one page. It's like nine point or something, eight point. I forgot what I made it, but it's a it's small. So there's something. Save paper. <laughs> yeah, save paper and then printing. Hmm. Actually, I don't remember. Ten, twelve. And it's chapter fifteen alone, right? Only chapter fifteen. Do we need a scan from No. Just mark your answers on the test. Have you graded the last one? No, I haven't. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the quizzes, I, s I went through them, but I haven't completed grading them. So this quiz is going to be not especially challenging, I think, since I haven't given it. We'll see. Maybe it's challenging. I, 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 sh I shouldn't say, because uh, always somebody will say, if I say it's not that hard, somebody's going to correct me and say it was hard. So everything's hard, <laughs> including uh, the report for this lab. The report for this lab is what we call a formal scientific report. And so how many people have uh, not written a formal scientific report? A formal scientific report would include like an abstract, introduction, that type of stuff. You haven't? Just two people? Three, four, okay. How much time? You don't have the entire semester. <laughs> yeah, this will be a group report. Uh, we'll have it due in a. Um, don't we have four formal reports? Three. You have three formal reports. And so this one will make due when? When do you want this one? Yeah. Two weeks? In two weeks? Is this for the synthesis or the quality? The synthesis. The quality of analysis is not a formal report. Three weeks? When do you want it to do? Uh -huh. um, um, do you have a sample? Not for the sample, but for the test. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you a sample report from previous semesters. I can show her mine though if they want to. Yeah, well, that one's different. Oh, different. Yeah, the 1A, this, the, the 1A, I, I made the 1A students write a formal report too, but that was, um, 
uh, analytical experiment. That's where you're analyzing, you know, some solid unknown for how much sulfate is in there. This one is a synthesis, and the synthesis, and this is why I have three, because of hitting different types of reports. In the synthesis lab, it's, a, it's written a little differently. I mean, there are some elements that are similar to the Chem 1A report, you know, but other elements that are, that are different. One of the things is, in a typical synthesis lab, you have, it's, it's usually synthesis and characterization <coughs> of blank, you know. And so if you look at most synthesis labs that are, you know, or reports that are based on just a synthesis, it's synthesis and characterization of this new compound or this old compound, but it's being synthesized a new way, you know? And so synthesis, that's no problem, that's making something, but what is characterization? Given it, it's like details of how it looks or identification. Identification, right. Characterization is identification. For example, um, you know, the oxalic acid we used is 98% pure, right? But when you looked at those crystals, you know, did it look 98% pure or did it look pure? You tell me. Did you see 2% impurities in the oxalic acid or not? You couldn't tell? That's, that's the characterization. So that chemical company synthesized the oxalic acid and then they characterized the oxalic acid. And they characterized it as being 98% pure with 2% impurities. And I showed you the list of impurities last time, right? Mm -hmm. This percentage of this, this percentage of that, right? What is our lab called? Oh, uh, no, the official title of our lab. Preparation, preparation synthesis, and reactions is synthesis, right? Preparation, reactions, yeah, it's a little synthesis. Where's the characterization? Where's the characterization? There is no characterization, right? And so the, the first question is, somebody's gonna ask you this. Anybody will ask you this. If you were to present this to, let's say, a group of scientists, they're gonna ask you, how do you know what you synthesized is what you synthesized, and how do you know it's purity? What is the purity of this, right? Because what you have to do is, nobody's gonna take your word for it. You know, that's, that's the nature of science. You have to offer some evidence, or you have to offer some proof that what you have is what you think you have. This is why, uh, if you recall back in, um, in the sulfate lab, you know, a lot of people in the report wrote like grams of barium sulfate, but you know, that's, that's not fact, right? What we know is we got grams of white precipitate that was trapped in the crucible. That's fact. What you know here is you got some grams of whatever, purple precipitate, purple crystals. That's fact, but do you know that that, that purple is actually potassium? What was it? Potassium trioxalate chromate? Three? Dihydrate? Dihydrate even. How do you know it's dihydrate? Wait, what if it's monohydrate, trihydrate? Is that fact? No, and so this is, you know, this is why uh, starting in Chem 1A I decided to do this is because a lot of labs, you don't think like a real scientist does because in a lot of these labs, you just take it. Oh, the, the book says so, therefore I, I believe it, you know? But once you start working in science, nobody believed you. Everybody's a critic, you know? It's not like they, they're trying to attack you, they just want to know. Right, right. They want to know. 
And so you got to think about that. Even though, I mean, is, are there ways we could characterize? Now, I said something about crystals. I don't know if anybody remembered. We want nice big crystals because crystals tend to do what? Hmm? You know, nice big crystals, they tend to... They tend to they tend to be of high purity and they tend to lock out impurities because to get big crystals everything has to fit perfectly in place right if you got an impurity substituting for something else that's going to offset the structure a little bit and the crystal can't grow <laughs> properly and so typically we want nice big single crystals when they make silicon chips they want to lock out the impurities and so when they make the silicon chips, they what they do is they recrystallize, recrystallize, recrystallize. That is, you know, um, they recrystallize it, and each time they recrystallize, they lock out more impurities. And so by the end of this, they have this jumbo size single crystal of silicon, which they cut into wafers. But, you know, that's a typical purification technique. A typical purification technique is recrystallization. And that's something you guys didn't do. You know, one thing you could do is you take your crystals, we, we've, we've locked out, we've washed out most of the impurities. You take those crystals, dissolve them again. How would you dissolve them again? What would you dissolve them in? Sorry. How would you dissolve them again? No. In water. You dissolve them in water and then how would you recrystallize them again? Add ethanol and cool it. And each time you repeat that procedure, you get impurities. And this is how you get from technical grade, like 98%, to analytical grade, which is like six nines or something. You do recrystallization after recrystallization to try to improve the purity of your crystals. You lose some, of course, each time you do that, but it's worth it if you need highly pure, pure stuff. And so one of the um, failings, one of the shortcomings of this experiment is that we don't do any characterization of our product. Did you? What's an, well, can you think of an easy way to characterize products? Purity. Like for example, if you, if you got a beaker of water, how do you know it's pure water before drinking it? Well, pH. E, uh, P, e, you could test pH, pH should be seven. What else? Boil. You could boil it to get the boiling point. The boiling point should be a hundred. You could freeze it. You could measure its density. There are a whole bunch of things you could measure, right? And so think about how we determine what the purity of water is and think. Um, not every characterization technique requires expensive instrumentation. A lot of these you could do on the fly. One of them is, um, for example, in organic chemistry that's often used because a lot of organic solids are low melting. That is, they have fairly low melting points. Um, one of the things you could do to characterize it is to take its melting point. Because when you take a, the melting point, you'll get two things. If the melting point matches the melting point of what you're looking for, then, yeah, th that's another piece of evidence, right? The other thing the melting point tells you is the degree of purity. Because the melting point, once you hit that temperature, it should all melt. But what happens is if you have a lot of impurities in there, in the crystals, those impurities, what it does is it disrupts the bonding network. As the bonding network's disrupted, then some bonds are weakened, right? More than others. And in fact, what you see is you see a range of bonds depending on how the impurity is placed in there. You know, you might not have great overlap or it might disrupt the distances. And so, when you have impure crystals, you get a wide melting point range. That is, it starts to melt at this low temperature, so here it's breaking the weak bonds. And then the temperature increases until you break the strong bonds. Whereas in a pure lattice, once you break the bonds, the whole thing collapses. And so in a pure, pure crystal, you hit that melting point and boom, it liquefies all. And you don't get much of range. So the tighter the range, the, the higher the P. 
security. And so melting point is a, a quick, quick, easy, cheap test to do if, if available, right? But how else do people characterize? How else people characterize is they'll take the, like a spectrum. You guys remember what a spectrum is? What do you do? You shine different kinds of light on it and see, you know, are you seeing the characteristic peaks of that spectrum? Like certain things. Uh, different spectra, as you saw in the uh, atomic emission. Level. Uh, there are other ways you can test. You know, you could do chemical reactions. You know, certain things only behave like this towards this chemical or that chemical. And so you could do simple chemical tests, etc. And so, let me start out the end of the paper, kind of. This is not the total end. The, the, the last part of the paper is references, but near the end you have a conclusion. And a lot of people think about a conclusion. A conclusion is just a summary of the paper, right? Well, not necessarily. In science, a conclusion isn't a summary unless the paper is longer than, let's say, 25 pages or 50 pages or something like that. Then you need a summary. For short pa pa papers, like, for short papers, you don't need any conclusion. People, people don't forget reading a short paper. You know. um, and so, um, for uh, we're concluding remarks, and we don't even need a conclusion. For concluding remarks, you want to say, you know, if you had resources or if you had time, what what would you do, you know, next time, or what what could you do to improve uh, what you have. And so one of these things that you could definitely do next time is to, or this time is to, characterize the product properly so we know what we have. And then you can make some suggestions. You just do some searching for characterization. And so this, uh, this paper will involve some research, right, uh, to find out. All right, this paper um, is also going to involve certain things, you know. Depending on your synthetic method, you can get an idea, you know, what types of impurities might you have or, you know, how pure it is, you know. For example, did you wash the crystals or you did not wash the crystals? It makes a big difference. If you didn't wash the crystals, then obviously they're going to be contaminated with the crust uh, salts when the water evaporates, right? How did you wash the crystals? You know, when did you know enough washing was enough washing? Right. Do you know, was that enough washing? And what did you wash with? Yeah. Yeah. And so there are certain things that uh, we, we do, but one of the things that we want to talk about in the body in <coughs> of this lab is the, uh, is this, is this method. And, uh, you know, there are, I got a lot of questions, and that's really good because people are thinking. Normally in um, chemistry, especially Chem 4, all people care about is mixing. Did they mix 10 milliliters or did they do not? They don't care about what that 10 milliliters is supposed to do or what. They just said the book says 10 milliliters or 15 grams or whatever, you know. But in Chem 1B, especially in the next lab, we completely ignore the amount, pretty much. You know, when you're working with unknowns, do you know, is it really going to take 10 milliliters? I mean, it's an unknown. How do you know how much stuff is in there, right? So in the next lab, every step of the procedure is adjusted on the fly. Every step. Because um, obviously everybody's going to have a different unknown, right? And, and everybody's going to be using different amounts of different reagents. And so rather than thinking, I need to add this many milliliters, you have to switch your thinking and thinking, in this step, I need to dissolve all this. And it, it, the lab manual will tell you, you know, add five milliliters to dissolve it, but if five milliliters doesn't dissolve it, right, then add more. But the reverse is true. If it dissolves on the first drop, would you add the remaining 400 drops? No, because you're going to be really hurting yourself by over dilution. And uh, probably the experiment's gone by then, I mean, unless you reconcentrate it. And so, you know, you, you switch from thinking about, you know, what 
the lab mount is saying, then you start thinking about what you, it's supposed to what's supposed to be happening, and uh, you adjust. Uh huh. Well, my plan is to do three, uh, which I've done um, three. The this one is a synthesis and well synthesis lab. The next one is a uh, titration lab, and the one after that is going to be a kinetics lab. Uh, three. This one. This one. Let's have the rough draft. I'm going to collect a rough draft for this one. Let's have the rough draft due in what two weeks? Did you say? A little more than, uh, actually, two weeks from today, can we have the rough draft? You haven't finished the experiment, but um, you could start writing. You, uh, okay, how about three weeks from now? Three weeks? A rough draft? Hmm? Is that doable? Yeah. I'll show you some example reports and uh, other stuff. But basically, um, we, we need to come up with a synthetic method for this. And so what, what was the reaction here? What types of reactions were we dealing with? Um, what was happening? And so the most important thing in a, a lab is what we call the discussion section. In the discussion section, you're just talking about what you're doing and what was happening chemically. And so, in this, what were we doing? You know, what was the first step of the synthesis here? What kind of reaction was that? A redox reaction. You know, here, in the discussion, we don't write any amounts. You know, we just talk about the redox reaction, what's happening. In the experimental section, we write the amounts. You know, so, so and so grams, you know this kind of stuff. And so we'll, we'll have this results in discussion or discussion section. And um, this is the most important section of the paper. Because, uh, you know, as, um, as I was asked earlier, you know, why are we adding 50% ethanol followed by 95% ethanol? That is a question that needs to be addressed in the discussion section of your report. You got to tell the reader why you're you're adding 50 followed by 95. You have to tell the reader why you're you're adding ethanol. You have to tell the reader why you're cooling in ice, right? You have to tell the reader why you added this to that rather than that to this. Those types of things. And so all that's going to go on the paper, but you know, what are some key points? And so um, the discussion, we don't write a list, but let's try to outline it. What are we going to talk about in the discussion? And so this will be an outline here. And then we're going to put it in paragraph form. So what types of things should we discuss about this experiment? What were some of the things that were important? The reactions, so let's talk about those first. Uh-huh. Reactions, yeah, definitely the reactions. So what was the first reaction? What was the purpose of the first reaction? It was oxalic acid with potassium dichromate. And the most important part of that reaction was to do what? Yeah, to synthesize chromium-3. Okay, so we started off with potassium dichromate and then we synthesized chromium-3 using a redox reaction and the oxidizer was oxidizer was potassium dichromate and the reducer was oxalic acid. Now, why that reducer? Why not any other reducer? Why oxalic acid as a reducer? 
It's a weak reducer, number one, because we don't want any violent reaction. It's a weak reducer. <coughs> Is that the only reason? Well, it's not, I mean, perfect crystal or not perfect crystal, it's okay. <laughs> Well, actually, um, oxalic acid wasn't, a, it, it was hydrated. Yeah, it's hydrated. Monohydrate. Yeah. Um, actually, the, the other reason is... You wanted to oxalate Right. The other reason is, um, when you do a react synthesis like this, are we doing it stoichiometrically, adding the perfect amounts of each reagent so that we have no excess reagent left over? No. Well, typically when we do a synthesis, we have a limiting reagent and we have an excess reagent. In this case, what was the excess reagent? Oxalic acid. Normally we have to remove the excess reagent to purify the product. But in this case, do we have to remove it? No, because we need oxalate anyway, right, for the next step. What was the next step? And so the first step was the redox, and then you can talk about the redox, you know, all the little details about the redox. Okay, then the next step is what? Yeah, you're adding the potassium oxalate, and uh, the purpose of that is the oxalate to attack what? The chromium-3. What kind of reaction is that? It's not a metathesis. It's a acid base reaction, right? Lewis acid base. Lewis acid base. And that's the next step. And is that it? No, that's not it because you know those give you the aqueous species. We don't want the aqueous, we want the the solid. So how did we generate the solid? Yeah, we added ethanol. Now, how did the ethanol do that? And so the next thing is to crystallize out the solid, or precipitate out the solid. How did we precipitate it out? Because our solid was water-soluble, like uh, the most potassium salts are water-soluble. And so how did we get a water-soluble you know, this is like, oh, I want to precipitate out sodium chloride. How would you do that? Sodium chloride is soluble. If you try to precipitate, tell me how you would precipitate out sodium chloride. It's soluble in water. Sodium chloride should not precipitate unless you evaporate the water. Did we evaporate the water? We didn't evaporate the water because we didn't want the impurities to crystallize out as well. Right. And so how did we crystallize it out? Well, you know, the, this is, so this is the purpose of the ethanol. What was the purpose of the ethanol? To crystallize it out. Now ethanol, um, well how does that work? You have to explain how that works. How does adding ethanol make this crystallize out? Yes, yeah, it's insoluble in ethanol, but soluble in water. Now, how do you transfer all the um, ions to ethanol? Well, you, you know, really, well, you know, ethanol and water are what we call miscible in each other. What does miscible mean? They're miscible. They form an ideal solution, which means what? Homogeneous, yeah, it's a homogeneous solution. But what does miscible mean? This is from Chem 1A. Miscible. Miscible. What does miscible mean? Versus immiscible. 
Missable and immissable are two terms that is used in chapter 13. They mix in. What's an ideal solution? Give me an example of an ideal solution. Water and ethanol. Water and ethanol is ideal. Give me another example of an ideal solution. Does anybody remember the example I gave last semester of an ideal solution? Maybe I'll do it again. Maybe maybe it wasn't uh, such a great one. I thought somebody wouldn't remember it because it's such a ridiculous solution. Water and water. Water and water. <laughs> you remember, or are you, are you just guessing? I, I guess remember. Okay, you remember. Water and water. This is ideal because uh, they're miscible in each other, right? And the same thing with ethanol. Ethanol and water are miscible in each other, which means you can mix. Is there any limit to how much water I can mix with water? No limit. And so the same thing with ethanol, surprisingly, because ethanol has no limit. So we start off with pure water. And this is why I say it doesn't matter how much ethanol you add, because it depends on how much water you start off with. Eventually, we start adding ethanol. And the percentage ethanol climbs, right? And so what we need to do is we need to go from water and then add a whole bunch of ethanol. Pretty soon, we add so much ethanol that there's a gigantic amount of ethanol and a tiny bit of water. If there's a gigantic amount of ethanol and a tiny bit of water, we stop calling it an aqueous solution and we start calling it an ethanol solution. There's a little bit of water dissolved in our ethanol. Does that make sense? So we're just transitioning. Water, add more ethanol, ethanol, and pretty soon it's all ethanol, right? Even though the amount of water is the same, right? This is just because we added so much ethanol. And so this is how we can convert the solution from a water solution to an ethanol solution just by adding ethanol. And it turns out that potassium oxalato, trioxalato, chromate is not very soluble in ethanol. In ethanol. And uh, how about warm ethanol versus uh, cold ethanol? Yeah, warm ethanol is going to vaporize more, but it's more soluble in warm ethanol, less soluble in cold ethanol. And so this is the trick to crystallizing it. Now, when we crystallize it, we want this. There's two types. For example, you know, do they make um, do they make silicon chips out of what we call polycrystalline materials? A whole bunch of little tiny crystals just glued together? No. They want one big single crystal. Because if you have a whole bunch of tiny crystals, do you think they're going to be as pure as one, no, as one gigantic crystal? Mm -hmm. And so the, the same thing here, when we crystallize it, we try to do this. In crystallization, there are two things that are most important. One is nucleation. Nucleation is, you know, you need a little surface or scratch or something where an ion can attach and then another ion can attach and another ion can attach to build up the crystal lattice, right? And so what we try to do to grow big crystals is try to minimize the nucleation sites. That is, keep dust away, make sure the glassware doesn't have any scratches, don't, don't stick your stir rod in there because stir rods will provide nucleation sites, right? Don't agitate the solution too much because bubbles could provide. And so we try to minimize the nucleation. And that way, if we only nucleize a few sites, then those sites will grow to big crystals. And so uh, that's that. And then um, hopefully the impurities have stayed locked out of the crystals. So you could you could read about recrystallization as a purification method. You know, but at least we're recrystallizing it. This is why I said do not let the water boil off. If all the water boils out, then we aren't doing a recrystallization process. That you know, it's the first crystallization. It's not really recrystallization. Um, all we're doing is we're doing co-precipitation. We're precipitating on a whole bunch of garbage, basically, in there. 
And so there's got to be water or ethanol left in there, hopefully, hopefully. And you want a good size volume. You want a good size volume so that whatever impurities you do have stay dissolved in that. You don't want the volume to go too low because, you know, it, we think about yield. If you think about yield, you want the volume low so we can maximize the amount of crystals. But we're thinking purity, you know. For purity, it's okay. Leave the volume big. We aren't going to get as many crystals, but at least we have less risk of them being contaminated. We always care about contamination. You know, uh, for example, um, and it's a big issue even for professional working scientists. Did you hear about the uh, ar uh, arsenic life form, arsenic-based life form? Yeah. Yeah. Mono Lake. You know, it was a NASA project where they're looking for, you know, other, other types of, of life and maybe a life that can survive off arsenic rather than phosphorus. We're phosphorus-based life form. They're, so arsenic and phosphorus are in the same family. Mono Lake has a lot of arsenic in there, and, so, and there are bacteria growing in there. And so the question came up, you know, are the bacteria metabolizing the arsenic? And so after uh, the, the original original paper was published, I think, in Nature, you know, which is, uh, Nature is very tough to get published because anytime you write a paper like this, you have to, in a, in a science, not on the web, you know, on the web it's what we call a non-refereed, uh, you know, non-peer-reviewed. Anytime you write a paper like this, it's peer-reviewed and you have to send it to like three different experts in the field. And those experts will read it and say, okay, this is garbage, do not publish this, you know, or they'll say, okay, this is okay, but you're missing a lot of stuff. Why don't you do, uh, do some more work? You know, um, otherwise you have a lot of weak points there. And so um, there was a lot of controversy about this because a lot of people said, you know, uh, how could this paper have been published because um, there were some problems and they should have done some more experiments to, to resolve it. But it turned out it was a, due to contamination. Just, uh, it's, it, contamination is a very serious problem, you know, in, um, in science, especially in qualitative analysis. Because in qualitative analysis, you may be a great, great lab technique, but unfortunately, somebody else in this lab, sloppy. And so what they do is they, they accidentally pour the silver into, or accidentally cross-contaminate. They use a, a dropper here, and then they contaminate the next solution here. And then you look at the next solution, it's got a precipitate in there, you know. And so uh, contamination, unfortunately, is bad uh, for us in the next lab, especially. So um, purity and these kinds of questions aren't easy, you know, to, to answer. You know, how pure are your crystals? Would you say they're 100% pure? 99.999% pure? You know, and how would you characterize that? Well, there's certain things, you know, we follow this procedure and following this procedure, we assume that we get, we're getting what we expect to be getting, right? We're getting what we expect to be getting. Now, the um, Lewis acid base, I had you finish this, remember from last time? The reaction for this. This is the skeleton redox. You guys remember skeleton redox? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Skeleton, uh, let, me th let me talk about it. If I have time. A skeleton redox is we know the dichromate goes to what? Dichromate eventually ends up as chromium 3 plus. And we know that the um, oxalic acid ends up as carbon dioxide gas. Yeah. This is called a skeleton redox, you know, because we know what the major products are, or they should be. Well, how do you know? You know, do you know what the color of chromium 3 is? Purple, right? The kind of purple color, and so uh, and dichromate is orange. So yeah, we have an idea. You know, the other chromium oxidation states are going to have different colors associated with those. 
we, we saw that clear colorless gas being evolved, right? And so this is what gives us an idea that this is the reaction that's occurring. And so what we just do is balance this. We split it up into half reactions and, and balance it that way. So, let's see. Yeah, that's the uh, redox reaction. What's, tell me what the Lewis acid base reaction looks like. Yeah, chromium three plus oxalate. Or it could be even oxalic acid. Oxalic acid would attack it the same way, you know, pop off the hydrogen. How many oxalates are we gonna need? Three, and this is gonna produce That's a chemical reaction, that's a Lewis acid base reaction. Now what we're gonna do is this is not a chemical reaction, right? This is a physical process. How do we crystallize it and how do we how how can we show that in equation form? We add methanol. Uh, not methanol. To crystallize? Methanol. Ethanol. You know, uh, if, if if anybody offers you methanol instead of ethanol because it, it's close and it's an alcohol, <laughs> don't drink it. <laughs> don't drink it because um, every year you know you guys probably don't see this in the news much but in the chem in the chemistry journals you'll see it every year like uh, last you know, last year there were 18 deaths in Central America from methanol com uh, consumption you hear about that no. South South America I think in the what was it Peru or Argentina multiple deaths, tens of deaths, you know? Because people are, are trying to ferment, um, rather than grain or sugar, they're trying to ferment wood to generate alcohol. Methanol is wood alcohol. So. Uh, the people who didn't die could uh, be permanently blind, you know? The, that, the wi that wife's trail is true, you know? You can go blind from drinking methanol. Methanol is oxidized in your body to methanoic acid or formic acid, and the formic acid apparently attacks the optic nerves irreversibly. And so you be permanently blind. Yeah, it's horrible. Uh, so e Eastern Europe was the last one, I think, I read. But anyway, going to this, um, how are we going to show this? How should we show this in equation form? Maybe, what do we need? What ions do we need to come together? Uh, and species do we need to come together? We need the ion here, trioxalato chromate 3 ion. What else do we need? We need the potassiums. We need three potassiums. And we need a water. And then we're going to add the ethanol. Adding the net ethanol, we'll just show here. Uh, no. Excess ethanol. And so th these were aqueous, right? Mm -hmm. But pretty soon it's going to switch from aqueous to an ethanol solution. And we're going to get out K3CrC2O4. Three <coughs> dot. How many waters is this? Tri hydro. Three H two O state. Solid. Solid. It's a complex ion. Yeah, it's a complex compound. A complex ion. And so this is it. And then what do we do? We have to add more. Ethanol. We wash these, right? This is important. Crystallize, wash. That's to get the impurities out. Yeah, to get rid of the impurities. And we let it dry. And so how do they know? How do they know three waters? Well, they must have characterized it, maybe. They must have characterized it, but you didn't. 
Somebody must have characterized it. I'd be curious to see how they characterized it. Well, that's it. You know, a paper like this, you want the basics down there, and then, you know, depending on where your research takes you, you can add additional information that you might find, you know, online that uh, would help you better understand what's going on here. All right, any questions on this? No. All right, let's take another break. And we'll start up again. How much is the paperwork? How much is the paperwork? What did I put, 30 points? 30 points, yeah. 